So are you now going to use this? Is this something different than what you've done before, Francisco? Yeah, You're going to use LHRH, letrozole, and ribocyclin? I think I'll be using mostly LHRH um, with uh, tamoxifen and ribocyclin. Um, the, the combination of an LHRH plus an aromatase inhibitor is, in my opinion, a little bit more toxic than LHRH plus tamoxifen. And if you add ribocyclin, the results are excellent. So I think it's another option for for our patients. Mom, same thing? Or yeah. different? No. So you're gonna use this, as, it's, it's something different than you've done before, or is it the same? No, I think we've been all doing it in our practice, and this is just confirming the data in a very nice way in a phase three setting with such a large population. But yeah, it gives you an option if you're not tolerating the AI plus LHRH, especially in these younger women, you can use tamoxifen as the backbone if that's what you prefer, or vice versa. And I would start with the AI. Um, <coughs> Uh, because in a metastatic setting, I want the best response rate. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, again, they were very small groups. The tamoxifen has a ratio was a little less good than the AI. And I think it depends if it's a de novo metastatic situation or right, not. Right, very good and, point. Uh, in that situation, it may be a little bit harder to give the AI and ovarian suppression right off the bat. But for most of our patients, they've already been exposed to endocrine therapy at one time or another, and so we tend to use AIs. But uh, again, I think that has to be individualized. You know, we had a patient who had, had DCIS and her next presentation was metastatic disease. And in that situation, she did better with tamoxifen up front. But mostly, I would like people to be on their first line therapy for as long as possible. And that's gonna be using an AI. So, so the, the, just to kind of a few more things and we'll move on. The first thing is that this is done with ribociclib. I'm assuming that Novartis may ask for label expansion for this indication. You know, will that drive you to use ribo in this setting, or do you think it's a class effect across all the CDK4-6s? It's a class effect. But, you know, we, when we're trying to decide how to use different agents, you know, you have to use the studies that are done, and right. uh, that's the only way for us to choose. Otherwise, it's like, okay, it's Monday. I'm going to use this drug. And Which is kind of what a lot of us so, may do. Yeah. <laughs> well, we extrapolate when we need to, but when we don't need to, we have the data here. We have the data, right. This is the one that has the data. Yeah, I, I think we all got comfortable using Pavocyclib. That was the first kit in the block when it came to CDK4-6 inhibitors, and I think we all use that a lot more and continue to lose that a lot more, I think, in practice. I do. Um, but I think this would p perhaps be... Uh, you know, the first kid in the block for premenopausal women. So I think if we had to go with and be a purist and use the label for that, I think we would okay. use ribocyclob in premenopausal mm -hmm. women. Francisco, you're on board with that too? Yeah, I, I think so. What so. Do you, I mean, what do you think of the issues of ribo versus, say, palbo? We'll get to abema in a minute. Any comments uh, you on know, that? I think that there's some benefits in terms of being able to dose reduce uh, by having the same drug and not have to get a new authorization and change, yeah. which oh, is a real pain. Um, now, I don't dose reduce a lot. I, I mean, I find the major reason for dose reducing is fatigue in older women. Uh, but I think, so I think that is an advantage with uh, both, really primarily with ribo more than the other two agents. But, uh, and the EKGs and the worrying about other drugs, I think is a bigger issue for older women than younger women. So I think, you know, one might try and parse out your decisions based on that. Yeah, that's a good point. Antidepressants was the big one for me. I mean, I don't yeah. really, I'm a medical oncologist. I mean, yes, we're all psychiatrists to some degree, mm -hmm. and we all will try an antidepressant, but I don't want to be sitting there messing with my patient's antidepressant. You know, if someone calls me up and says, you can't we use can't ribo because they're on... Right? Right. I don't want to do that. We have enough trouble with that. tamoxifen in that. Right. I mean, we have, you know, I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> That's the only thing that, that bothers down. me a little bit about this. But let's go, that kind of brings us to a little bit different story. I mean, what is the quality of life? I mean, Sarah Tulaney presented data on Mona Lisa 2. Does anybody have a comment on that, on that data? I think, yeah, I think we all uh, try to in metastatic So Mona Lisa 2, just to explain to the audience, what was right. that Right, so um, Mona Lisa 2 was looking at uh, ribociclib with letrozole in postmenopausal women in the first line setting uh, and has been approved for that indication and that's what we have been using uh, in addition to the Paloma 2 data that we have with palbociclib. So I think this was good to see that not only do we have an impact um, on progression-free survival in these trials, but we also make an impact on the quality of life of these patients, which is very, very important in the metastatic and palliative setting. Um, the other interesting thing that that data uh, uh, you know, uh, showed was that there was a significant reduction in pain scores by eight weeks for these women uh, with pain. So I think that is very comforting to hear for our patients in the palliative setting. Yeah, I think the really cool thing about these drugs that I'm starting to realize, I think, we see it in the trials and we're really seeing it now clinically. I'm curious about people's impression about this, is that the response rates are kind of like chemo. You know, you they're better. Curious. They're better in some cases. They're better I than really, chemo. They're better. 
And I think that, you know, we're talking about, especially when we talk about neoadjuvant therapy in a few minutes, I mean, you know, people that you would have thought about giving chemo to up front in the neoadjuvant setting or even the metastatic setting, because you've got to reduce their pain, you've got to get a rapid response, it turns out these drugs actually probably have the same degree of response rate, don't they? It's a little slower. It's a little slower, the but speed, not... The speed, but the percentages. The percentages I mean, in, in are as good. Positive patients, these are the most effective therapies, uh, combination of, a combination of an AI plus ribocyclib or any or of the other CDK4-6 inhibitors, in my opinion, is the most effective combination. And what we saw is that in, on top of that, it improves the quality of life of the patient. So what else do, do that's the best we can expect for in a yeah. patient, especially with metastatic disease. So I, I'm, I was very pleased to see that, because um, some patients, even with metastatic disease, don't have any symptoms. So you give chemo and their quality of life, of course, is worse, even though the scans look better. So the fact that the quality of life was improved with ribocyclib and letrozole was very reassuring compared to letrozole alone in patients with metastasis who may or may not have symptoms. So this is a really important point. You can't make an asymptomatic it. patient better. Right. And in this case, you're giving an additional drug, and the quality of life improved just like it did with letrozole because the patients had their symptoms controlled. So now we can feel really comfortable. We have an effective therapy. It's, it has mild to moderate toxicity. And really, most of the moderate toxicity is lab, lab toxicity. Yeah. Right. It doesn't so matter ever so you know, to the patient. Counts go down. So, except for fatigue. It's right. not the fatigue same. Fatigue is bigger than we think. Fatigue it, is definitely bigger. Fatigue is a big in, issue. In and my experience, it's very well tolerated. Ribocyclic is extremely well tolerated. It's I interesting agree. because you know the FDA analysis that looked at older women and all the three combined trials in the first-line setting Definitely showed. I mean, it's kind of interesting for me to look at that, that, you know, overall the toxicity was about the same, right? But if you looked at grade three, four toxicity, it's mainly grade three, it was higher. Now, the numbers are small, the but it's women. higher than the, 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 the old women. And they looked at, you know, over 60, 65, 70, et cetera, and, you know, really focused on the patients over the age of 70, which I think would all, we would all agree is older, not elderly. But uh, and Depends. you know the we you know we've looked at but it the in the palbociclib. The efficacy was We've looked at in the palbociclib group. It's been looked at in the uh, ribociclib group, and a little not quite as much in the bemociclib yet, but I'm sure it will be. And the combined analysis, I think, just gives us a whole lot more power. Uh, so I thought that you know what was interesting to me was the number of dose reductions and dose discontinuations were higher in the older women too. And so that goes along with the fact that we have to be sensitive to the fact that the older patients are going to be more sensitive to serious toxicity, and I think fatigue is the biggest Fatigue's one that I thing. see. Fatigue is the My practice I mean, in fatigue like, now is probably more like 10%. You know, it's reported at like 5% or something. I think it's double that. Grade three, you're talking three. about. Grade three. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Three. That, that would be dose reduced. Patients. I have you a patient, I keep reducing. giving her a month off here and there because she just says I'm so now, tired, has anybody you know? Has anybody had it? We'll talk about a BEM in a minute, but you think it's specific to the drug? Do you see less fatigue with ribo than PABO, or is it about the same? I th it's hard to tell. It's hard to say. I but, think it's about uh, the same. It's probably and actually, if they, they didn't look at that separately within this analysis of... Uh, that Singh presented from the FDA, so it's hard to know. I, I doubt you, given the small numbers, I don't think you'd really be able to tell any difference. But as, as Hope was uh, mentioned earlier, the dose reduction, I think, is much easier with ribocyclib. You go from 600 to 400 to 200, uh, same dose, three pills, two, one. And um, I've had patients, I have a few patients on the Mona Lisa 2 study, which are now even on 200 milligrams with stable disease going three, three and a half years. So it's, it's a very, uh, um, when you go to those levels uh, and still the disease remains stable, it's very well tolerated. Yeah, we're all starting to see these long-term patients. I mean, now that the drugs have been on the market a couple of years, I mean, three, four years out now. Yeah. Just doing really well. On the Mona Lisa so 2, she was on the trial, right? She was on the trial. On the trial. Yeah. I, w I wondered if we're going to start doing what some people do with Everolimus, where they started with a lower dose and then they go up on the dose as patients tolerated it. And the data for dose reduction not impacting the efficacy or not reducing the efficacy with Paloma 3 has been you know, published already. And I wonder if that could be something one could see or but look at, especially in the But that's hard to extrapolate because you see the, the dose, yeah. the, you see the response so early that if you start with a lower dose, I don't know. And the toxicity from the drugs is, uh, you know, the fatigue in my experience, even though people haven't shown any uh, change in the percentages of toxicity in long-term follow-up, with the CDK4-6 inhibitors overall, and the diarrhea, which we'll talk about soon, is early. 
I think the fatigue is a late thing. It's it's a long-term therapy thing. So, it's you know, unlike everolimus where we worry about that initial so, toxicity and now we can control the stomatitis, but I, I think that there's no real reason to start lower. And I agree with you that I don't think we can extrapolate well, so I, I wouldn't. I, 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 I would agree. start at the top start and then, it, start it and full then, then slow down. down. Yeah. Right.